Hello, my name is Wesley Dunn. I am the Minister of Discipleship at First Baptist Owensboro, and I want to welcome you to this study of Isaiah. We are in our third session of our study, and we are in chapter 7. So if you have a Bible with you, or if you have your personal study guide, uh, the Lifeways Explore the Bible, that's what we're utilizing. If you have that, you can turn it to the session. But uh, if you have your Bibles, turn it to Isaiah chapter 7. That's where we will be today. And so as we begin our time together, I'm grateful once again for you joining me on this video. And if this is your first time with us, we're glad you're here. And we are walking through uh, week after week a study through the book of Isaiah, a, a book that is quoted very often in the New Testament. It's an important book of the Bible as we see the prophecies of God fulfilled in the New Testament over and over and over again. And so we want to study this book to know what God has been doing in the past, what he's doing now, and what will be going on in the future. But we're in chapter 7 today, and before we get started, I want to open us up with a word of prayer. God, we come to you asking for understanding of your word, asking that you would fill our minds with who you are, what you do, and how you accomplish your pur purposes. Lord, we know this lesson is entitled that you make promises, God's promises. Lord, help us to see your promises, to understand your promises, and to trust you with faithfulness in your promises. Lord, that is our prayer. Help this text, this beautiful passage of chapter 7, to be ingrained in our hearts that we might understand all these truths and live faithfully before you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I, I'm using our Explore the Bible curriculum as I teach, but one of the things I'm doing is I'm often as a teacher, I'm looking to some other sources. And one of the things I'm looking at uh, is Andy Davis, Andrew Davis's uh, Christ Centered Exposition series, uh, the commentary from that series on Isaiah. I'm utilizing some of that today. And so you'll see me reference that uh, a number of times. But he has an, an introduction and really an opening and, and an introduction with a background that I think is helpful. I'll be reading some of that here in a moment. But Andrew Davis thinks that, and I agree with him, he says the major, um, the, the, the major, the number one thing that is being questioned or asked of us in this text in chapter 7 is this question. What are you trusting in? We could say who are you trusting in, but what or who are you trusting in? That's going to be the central question of chapter 7. And so as we begin, you already should begin thinking about who or what are you trusting in. You see, most of the time as we go through our daily lives, when we're carrying out the, the mundane activities of life, life, we aren't really challenged to consider and think, okay, I'm doing this and that that I'm very used to. I'm kind of in my bubble. Everything's safe. Everything's going good. I don't, I'm not really pushed or pressured to consider who or what am I trusting in. But you see, when the, the tough times of life, the difficulty, the dangerous times of life comes, then we are pressured and pushed to consider who or what am I trusting in? Who am I turning to? What am I turning to to help or support or undergird me during this tough time? And Davis says, what you're trusting in is most clearly revealed during a crisis. To prove this to us, God brings trials and circumstances that will jar us from our comfort zones. And sometimes He will bring extreme suffering to cause us to lose all other sources of trust than God Himself. So it is in this chapter, the lesson of Isaiah 7 is stop trusting in yourself and stop trusting in Stop trusting in yourself and stop trusting in your shrewd alliances. Throw yourself on God alone. That's what Davis says. And in our Explore the Bible curriculum, the, the, the lesson is entitled God Promises. And it, it ultimately, the summary statement is this, that since God is sovereign, His people can trust His promises. So we're going to see here in Isaiah 7 that King Ahaz, who is the leader of the southern kingdom uh, of the Jews, which is, in, is the southern kingdom of Judah, he's going to have a choice to make. God's making promises. Will he trust them? And ultimately, we're going to see that God is sovereign and he is in charge. And when he makes a promise, he keeps it. He's faithful to it. And because of that, we can trust in him. 
We can trust in Him when times are good and when crisis comes. But that's what Ahaz is presented with, and that's what we're going to be challenged with today as we look at chapter 7. So I want to help set the context of what's going on here in chapter 7. And I turn to Davis once again. I, I, I hate to just read to you, but it's so good. I think it's helpful in understanding what's happening here in chapter 7. He says this, In the Old Testament, God often taught vital spiritual lessons to His people through political and military events. The historical context of Isaiah 7 is such a time. After the death of Solomon, Israel had been split into two, the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. At the time of Isaiah 7, Judah was ruled by a wicked king named Ahaz. I've already mentioned his name. The two Jewish kingdoms were often at war with each other, and so it was, so it was in Ahaz's day. These two tiny kingdoms were among several small nations of the region like Edom and Aram and Syria and Philistia, bit players on the state of geopolitics. geopolitics. They were often dominated by larger empower, empires such as the Assyrians, who we're going to hear about, who threatened the entire region with their military power. Assyria was the big monster swimming in the small pool of the ancient Near East. Its people were violent and ruthless. They were somewhat, as Davis says, the Nazis of the ancient world. Their emperor was an expansionist who wanted Egypt. So he wanted to get to Egypt, which was the breadbasket of the world, the, the main resource driver of the world. But Palestine stood in the way and composed of these small nations that stood in the way. This monster Assyria was poised to gobble up all these minor nations like a lion devour, devouring scraps of meat. And beyond that looming threat, sometimes these smaller kingdoms like Aram and, and Israel, the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, and Edom, all these places, they allied together and would threaten other small kingdoms with conquest. This is just what King Ahaz and Judah were facing. Israel and Aram allied together and sought to conquer Judah, and specifically Jerusalem, its capital city. And the news of the alliance between Aram and Israel return, uh, resulted in the hearts of Ahaz and his people trembling like trees of a forest shaken by a strong wind. That's verse 2 of chapter 7. Their fear was faithless. They never seemed to think of turning to the sovereign Lord for protection. The people were as weak in faithlessness as their leader. God brought this crisis on Ahaz to show him how empty his soul was and how great was his need to trust in the Lord. The plans of the scary alliance of Israel and Aram were plain to put an end to the Davidic dynasty and install their own puppet king. And they wanted to put one of their sons over Judah and Judah's trembling heart shows the weakness of their faith. Get a quick drink here. <clears throat> so, what we have at work here is what's going on at the beginning of chapter 7. And I want to read that for you. This took place during the reign of Ahaz. And, and it goes on to say that these two kings, Aram's king Rezan, Israel's king Pekah, son of Ramelia, went to fight against Jerusalem, but they were not able to conquer it. Verse 2 tells us, When it became known to the house of David that Aram had occupied Ephraim, Ephraim being the northern kingdom, that's a name for it, uh, one of the tribes, and that ultimately became the name uh, uh, that was used often to reference the northern kingdom. It occupied Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz, and the hearts of the people trembled like trees of a forest shaking in the wind. And this is what the Lord told Isaiah in verse 3. All right, Isaiah, you're my prophet. Go out with your son... Share of Jeshu to meet Ahaz at the end of the conduit to the upper pool by the road to Londurer's field. Say to him, Calm down and be quiet. Don't be afraid or cowardly because of these two smoldering sticks, the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and the son of Remelio. For Aram, along with Ephraim and the son of Remelio, has plotted harm against you. They're saying, hey, let's go up to Jerusalem, terrorize it, conquer it for ourselves. Then we can install Tobil's son as king in it. Verse 7, this is what the Lord God says. It will not happen. Do you hear that promise? He says this, those two are afraid of Assyria, so they're wanting to become allies, and, and they need some more support. So they're going to try to come take you over, Judah. That's what they're planning and plotting to do. They want to, they want to come take you over. Ahaz, being the leader, is fearful that they're going to come conquer him, make him no longer king, and make this whole group of people have to fight on their side against this big king. And he's fearful of that. 
And God says, they're planning on doing that. You know that. I know that. But my promise is this. It will not happen. It will not occur. Verse 8, the chief of Aram is Damascus. The chief of city of Damascus is resin. Within 65 years, Ephraim, northern kingdom, will be too shattered to be a people. The chief of Ephraim is Samaria, and the chief city of Samaria is the son of Ramelia. If you do not stand, this is, this is what Isaiah, God is having Isaiah say to Ahaz, the king of Judah. He promised him it's not going to happen. He promised him it's not going to occur. That, that he's going to be taking over by these two smaller kingdoms. And he says this, Ahaz, if you do not stand firm in your faith, then you will not stand at all. He has made a promise. He is now warning him. I'm telling you, this is what, this is what God is saying, through Isaiah to Ahaz the king, I'm telling you, these two small kingdoms who you are fearful of is going to come take you over to make you fight against Assyria along with them. It's not going to happen. It's not going to occur. I'm not going to let it happen. But if you don't stand firm in your faith of my promise to you, then you will not stand at all. Meaning, you're going to fall regardless. So we have here God intervening, and He's saying, I am going to make you this promise, but I'm warning you, if you don't listen, if you don't have faith in the promise that I'm giving, you're not going to stand at all. Well, <clears throat> we go on in verse 10. And this is the Lord beginning to speak to Ahaz. Not through Isaiah, but the Lord says this. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz. Ask for a sign from the Lord your God. So he, he, write, he, he hands Ahaz a blank check. Now signs would have been used in this day to confirm the Lord's presence and the Lord's working. We see them in other instances of the Bible. We see the signs. That I think most notably we see some signs given at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, there's signs happening. We know that the Lord is at work and His presence is there. We do see, though, that there is a time when Jesus condemns those who um, are demanding a sign because Jesus knows that even if they're given a sign, they're not going to have faith. But God is saying right here, Hey, Ahaz, ask for a sign from the Lord your God. It can be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. Now, Sheol is down to the depths of the grave all the way up to heaven. So the extremes of anything on this earth, you ask for it, I'm giving you a blank check. Ahaz is given whatever he wants as a sign to confirm the promise that God has given and Ahaz says this, I will not ask. I will not test the Lord. In arrogance, he, God has commanded him to do something. Demand a sign. He, he's commanded him to ask for a sign. And Ahaz goes against that command and says, I'm not going to test the Lord. Playing this pious role of, oh, I'm not going to do that. I'm not supposed to do that. Even when God has commanded him to do, to do so. And Isaiah said, now, Isaiah has grown frustrated in this whole situation. He's, he's fuming at this point. The prophet is fuming, and he said, Listen, house of David, he's speaking to Ahaz, who is in the lineage of the Davidic king, of King David. He says, Listen, house of David, who is a representative, Ahaz is a representative for all the people. Is it not enough for you to try the patience of men? Will you also try the patience of my God? Now notice what happened here when Isaiah got frustrated with Ahaz because he's not going to hold on to the promise of God of protection. He's instead going to turn, we'll see in a moment, turn to his own alliances and his own strength and, and the strength of other men. But he's turning down the Lord's, the Lord's offering of a sign and Earlier we saw in verse 11 that God said to Ahaz, Ask for a sign from the Lord your God. Now Isaiah says this, Is it not enough for you to try the patience of men? Will you also to try the patience of my God? He has moved away from that language of, Hey Ahaz, this is your God, to now he's saying, Hey Ahaz, this is my God. Isaiah no longer believes that Ahaz has any covenant relationship with the God that he has. So 
we have here this whole situation of fear being set up in, in Ahaz and the people, and God makes a promise. He, he warns what happens if they don't trust Him in this, that they will fall. And Ahaz says, I will not ask. I will not test the Lord. What's, what's going on at the core of Ahaz that he won't hold on to the promise, that he won't have faith, that he won't trust in this? Well, we know if we look to 2 Kings, appreciate this being in the commentary this week, 2 Kings 16, 7 through 16, provides additional information on Ahaz's unwillingness to trust the Lord or even ask for a sign. The king, Ahaz, had sent a tribute bribe and a plea for protection to the Assyrian monarch. Ahaz was willing to make Judah a vassal state of Assyria, meaning they, they would come under Assyria's rule, and to introduce a pagan altar into the Jerusalem temple in order to gain Assyria's military help against Aram and Israel. In so doing, the king squandered his opportunity to see the Lord do a great work of salvation on behalf of Judah. Here's what's gone on. He's been given the opportunity by God to ask for a sign to confirm the promise of protection by God. And instead, he is unable to take on that request because he's already in the works of joining up with the, with the Assyrians. And in joining up with the Assyrians, as you can imagine, what he's doing is he's submitting them to all their ways and all their leadership, meaning that their trust is no longer in the one true God, but in the leadership and protection of the military of Assyria. He has turned from trusting in the Lord. And ultimately, the, the nation of Judah has turned from trusting in the Lord and has now put their trust in Assyria. You see, when things were going well, the trust or the faithlessness of Ahaz was not exposed. But now that a crisis has come, it's on full display. It's on full display who Ahaz and this nation places their trust in. It's a sad thing. It's heartbreaking to see this from, from God's people not turning to Him during their time of crisis. But even as I say it's sad and it's heartbreaking to look at Ahaz and the nation of Judah in this way when crisis comes, we have to ask ourselves, when crisis comes to us as individuals, to the church, where do we turn? Where do we place our trust in? Is it in God who has given us everything and is sovereign over all things? Or do we place our trust in the next great thing that somebody's recommending or this thing that the culture is doing? That, that might work. That might help give us support for what we need. Or this person, man, they've got a lot of resources. If we can just lean on them over here, then we can get accomplished what we need to get done. But in all of that, what we're doing is we're not placing our trust in God who can provide for and is in control of all things. As we look at this, I'm, I'm challenged personally of when things come up in my household, when crisis come, whether that's health, whether that's finances, whether that's in parenting, whether that's relational and dealing with other people, all kinds of things can come before you and, and be placed on your table in your home of crisis and I'm being challenged to go where's my first turn is it to something or someone else or is it to the sovereign God of all the universe so we see in verse 13 that Isaiah has gotten a little testy with Ahaz and asking him these questions verse 14 goes on to say this therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign so you're not going to ask for one He's offered it to you, Ahaz. You've rejected it, but God is still going to give you a sign. See, the virgin will conceive, have a son, and name him Emmanuel. By the time he learns to reject what is bad and choose what is good, he will be eating curds and honey. We have what we see here, an announcement. 
Isaiah declared that God would provide a sign despite Ahaz's unbelief, and it's a virgin would give birth and name the child Emmanuel. Now, the question is, this is a passage that we most often think of as an announcement of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. And, and Davis deals with that. Um, the, he says, The sign of Emmanuel carries with it three difficult interpretive issues. Number one, was there an immediate sign in Ahaz's time? So was this speaking to something directly that was going to happen during that time? Number two, does this verse, this verse teach the virgin birth? Three, what is the significance of the word Emmanuel? So first, was there an immediate sign in Ahaz's time? Yes, that's the answer. Christian prophecy often has a type and a fulfillment, a shadow and the reality. Something was acted out imperfectly in space and time at the, at, during Ahaz's time, illustrating some aspect of Christ's future coming. Christ then perfectly fulfills that shadow with the bright light of his life and ministry. And secondly, does this verse teach virgin birth? Again, yes, Matthew 1, 22 and 23 directly ascribes this prophecy to Jesus, settling uh, for Christians whether Isaiah 7, 14 taught the virgin birth. The challenge with this prophecy is that the virgin conception and birth of Jesus Christ were unique in all of history, and we do not refute that. So, so the Hebrew word virgin is Alma, a word that can refer to a virgin but that doesn't emphasize her virginity. The imperfect, shadowy, prophetical type of Isaiah's day was that an ordinary young woman would conceive Emmanuel in the ordinary way. But the perfect fulfillment was of a true virgin, Mary, who conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then thirdly, what is the significance of the name Emmanuel? This word means God with us. And the significance in Ahaz's day was that the true source of Judah's safety was the fact that God Almighty was protecting it. God is making promises. He is an affirming those promises and He is giving hope that He is going to give a sign whether Ahaz wants to receive or reject the sign. It doesn't matter. He's going to give the sign of hope. And for some who would place their faith in these promises given by God, there was a faithfulness to be had there in obedience that they had a hope that they could lean on. So we see that God has intervened. He's not going to allow these two smaller kingdoms to take him over. He expects, in the next section, in 10 through 13, he expects something, but there's a rejection. Isaiah responds and kind of gets on to Ahaz for this. And then there's an announcement of hope, of promise, in 14 and 15. And then when we look at 16 and 17, it says this, for before the boy knows, this is the Emmanuel that's coming, that's, 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 that's talked about being born. For before the boy knows to reject what is bad and choose what is good, the land of the two kings you dread will be abandoned. The Lord will bring on you, your people, and your father's house such a time as has never been since Ephraim separated from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. So, God is saying, listen, I made you that promise about Ephraim and Aram, like that they're, they're not going to be able to do what they're going to do. I'm bringing judgment on them. They're going to be off the map. They're going to be wiped off the map. But guess what? I'm also going to judge you for your faithlessness, Ahaz, and all the people of Judah. There's a faithlessness that's going to be judged. Earlier, he said, if you do not stand firm in your faith, then you will not stand at all. They're not going to stand. Now, Ahaz thought that he was going to provide protection for himself and protection for his people by bringing the king of Assyria to himself. But God says, there's going to be judgment coming. It's going to look different. You're not going to be able to stand because of the judgment. And you think you're, bringing a, you think you're bringing the king of Assyria to your place for your purposes and your plans? That's not how this works. God is saying, I'm the sovereign one. And Isaiah says, he, being God, will bring the king of Assyria. Ahaz is not bringing the king of Assyria to Judah. God is. And the reason God is doing this is in a form of, of judgment for the faithlessness 
that Ahaz has demonstrated during this time of crisis. The heat of life, the crisis of life, has exposed Ahaz's faithlessness. And he's being judged for it. The nation as a whole is being judged for it. Now what comes before us is the question of this. When the crisis of life, when the heat of life comes, will we trust the promises of God? Or will we trust in our own alliances, in our own things that we can turn to, uh, other things, other systems, other rulers, other worldly possessions and material things? Are we going to turn to those? This is a tough, tough thing to deal with. Because when you're not in the middle of a crisis, it's hard to have it exposed. And God in His sovereign ways is exposing this. Just as was said in Davis' introduction, there are times when God will bring, and He said, when you're trusting, what you're trusting is most clearly revealed during a crisis. To prove this to us, God brings trials and circumstances that will jar us from our comfort zones. What is God using to jar you from your comfort zone and, and challenge and expose what you're trusting in? I think this is a good question to, to wrestle with. Because the bottom line, as Davis goes on to say, is what you trust in other than the Lord will totally destroy you in the end. Ahaz and Judah were trusting in Assyria to save them, and what ends up happening later on? They're completely destroyed by the Assyrians. That's true in our own life. Whatever we trust in, as is said here, what you trust in other than the Lord will totally destroy you in the end. Seven centuries later, this is, I appreciate Davis wraps this whole thing up with a great conclusion. And, and I think it's helpful for us to, to think through this. Seven centuries later, God remembered the sign he had given to Ahaz, and he fulfilled the words perfectly, Virgin and Emmanuel being God with us. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we know what happens. He brings about Jesus Christ born of a virgin, God with us. Now, this is a deliverance that God had promised for Ahaz, but when we look at all of human history, by far the greatest deliverance Jesus will work for us, and listen, crisis will come and we will be delivered from them And if we have faith in our everyday life, but by far the greatest deliverance Jesus will work for us is on the judgment day, when he will claim us as his own. He will not abandon us on that day, but will say, I know you. You're mine. Enter into the joy of your salvation. He will deliver us from death and hell and bring us safely into his eternal kingdom. All other deliverances are nothing, or as nothing compared to that one. The ultimate trial we are going to face is judgment day. What we rely on now in the lesser trials of life, the smaller things, which in the moment they don't seem like smaller things, but but really they are. What we rely on, on the, in these lesser trials of life will ultimately expose and reveal who, will we, who or what we will be trusting in when judgment day comes. So the question for you today, the question for me today is, who or what are you trusting in? We, we see the title of this lesson is that God promises. Since God is sovereign, His people can trust His promises. He has made promises to us over and over and over and none greater than that there is salvation to be found in His Son, Jesus Christ, by repenting of our sin and trusting in Him. So, who are you trusting in today? What are you trusting in today? God has made promise after promise. We can see that He has fulfilled promises and we can trust in Him for being faithful in these promises, but there is still a fear that rises up in us during times of crisis that will expose and challenge us. The question is, who or what are you trusting in? My prayer for you today, my prayer for myself, my prayer for my own home, my prayer for First Baptist Church is that we will be trusting when times of crisis come, we will be trusting in the God of all the universe. But ultimately, I want to challenge you today when the greatest moment in history of judgment comes, your day of judgment comes, are you going to be trusting in Jesus Christ? I pray that you will. I pray that you will. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for our time in the Word today. We are challenged. We are challenged to be considering who or what we're trusting in. And Lord, 
by the power of your spirit, would you embolden us to have faith in our great promise maker and promise keeper, you. Help us to have faith in you when the small trials of life come, but also for our biggest problem, our sin problem, our, our facing of death and hell and destruction. Help us to, in that time of crisis, now understanding that's to come before us, that we are trusting in you and not in ourselves or anyone else. Lord, our prayer is all made today in His name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining me on this video. I hope and I pray that you will be trusting in our Sovereign Lord today. I look forward to joining you next time as we will approach Session 4. God bless.